Yes, please, uh, especially since after hours. <laughs> yeah, because we're after hours. And I noticed you've got a, a improv team here, so they're probably getting hot as we are. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, but, yeah. They, do the, they do their improv, improv uh, comedy at uh, the underground. The, um, what is alchemy? Alchemy. Alchemy. Oh, okay. Well, they're using your space. They're in the room across the hall, right the side of each of you guys. I need to get the air turned back on. Oh, I see. Okay. All right, well, thank you for coming back. Yes. Yes, I do. I have air conditioning, but it's, my wife thinks I keep it too cold. Which one do you want? This is not seem to move. One in the middle? Okay. okay. Are we on the all natural cooling? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> hey. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Jeremy. Doors open. Frank. I don't think that'd be a problem. Water bottles in the fridge? As long as I'm in here, I'm outside of this room, it's a real problem. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye bye. Talky. <coughs> Some people are. Well, hey, everybody. Glad y'all could come to the uh, South, uh, Upstate Carolina Linux Users Group. I was going to say the Southeast Links, but <laughs> <laughs> that's your doing. And um, it's good to see some new faces here. I'm glad to, to have you here. Um, uh, I'm sure you've been on the mailing list for a long time and you're just now uh, showing up for once. Um, but we're, we've got a treat tonight. Columbia, are you there? I thought I saw some. I can barely hear you. Speak up, say, it, say a little more. Okay. I think that's my side. Yeah, that's your sound. Oh, it's all the way up. Okay. No, it's. What's going on? Yeah. There you go. That sounds better. Good. So can you all see uh, Zach's first slide? Intro. Or IT for the home building. Can you all see that? Okay. Excellent. Now is someone there going to be able to record? Are you recording also? Are you, uh, is someone there recording? Usually it's Ben that's recording. I don't know how to do it. Okay. We'll, re we'll rely on Zach's recording. Anyway, so welcome to everyone. This is Zach Underwood. And he's just stepped away. So how's everybody doing? <laughs> how many people's in Columbia tonight? There's 12 here tonight. Fantastic. All right, ready, Zach? Oh, here's a couple more. We have four, 15 tonight. Hooray. Hello, welcome. We're starting now. This is Zach Underwood, everybody. Hello, this is, um, this is a little bit about my story on how I went from an IT, build, an IT to a crazy home builder. Um, I'm Zach Underwood, 27. Um, my, in our home, we have my wife, who's actually here, um, two dogs and a cat, and 440 square feet. So smaller than this little area um, enclosed by the tables. It is 20 feet wide, 20 feet deep, and 16 foot vaulted ceilings. And I decided to go about it the crazy way. I bought the land, built a house, moved in, and married all within eight months. <laughs> it was a very hard first year of marriage. 
Um, intro of the house. Um, it is a house. It is not a tiny home on wheels. I, it, I, I, I wanna, one of the things I want to make clear is this is a normal house, just small. I didn't go out and do something like an RV, um, like um, what you see on TV on, on the wheels. Um, it's 440 square foot. It is permitted and certified for a residential use by Spartanburg County. It is a legal home. I can't, I can and do have insurance on it. I can get a mortgage against it. It is a normal home, just small. Um, it is connected to the grid. Yes, the grid. Um, so much about the tiny home is about living off the grid, which is, it, being off the grid is somewhat of a joke. You have to radically change your behaviors. And if you want to live a traditional life, you have to be connected to the grid. You know, if you want to laundry, cooking, you want to take a hot shower, you want to do, watch TV, you want to have a server, all this requires the grid. And frankly, it was cheap. Um, I'll get to that in a little, bit, a little bit. And it is not a home on wheels. It is built on a concrete a monolithic slab, um, so it's not going anywhere. Timeline. I, we found land in December of 2016. Um, we had a two month or 60, or 60 day waiting period from the time when we put in our offer um, and deposit until we actually closed on the land. Closed on the land in January, and we had the foundation and the, drive, and the driveway installed by March. Um, and a little bit of that took wrangling contractors. We had, a, last year was a very wet year. Um, and so it's hard to do digging and grading when everything is wet. It's a mud, it's a mud pit. Um, we then had the drywall and paint done in July. We moved in July. The house was actually finished in, in January of this year. So we went seven months living in a house that wasn't yet done. I ran out of money. Um, I, I, I had a job change. I had a lot of expenses come up, ran out of money, so I couldn't finish the kitchen. Um, Spartanburg County requires you to have a functional kitchen. Um, which is not just a stove, a sink, um, refrigerator. They want a complete kitchen before they'll certify it as finished. Um, and so we had to wait the seven months until we got a finished kitchen before they would give us our um, certified of occupancy so that we could get insurance. So we, we spent seven months with no insurance, which is a little interesting when if a house, if, if a fire was a catch out, you could lose everything and have no recourse. Um, for those periods, we did have a stove, we had a refrigerator, we had a functioning sink. We just didn't have any countertops or cabinets. Um, and so it took, it took a little bit of time to actually save up for that. And once we started the process of installing the kitchen, we had to take our temporary sink out. Um, because we had to, I had to paint the floors, I had to do other prep work, and so that meant doing dishes in the bathtub. <laughs> oh my God, I hated doing dishes in the bathtub. Um, I mean the land. Um, this, this actually turned out to be a rather lengthy and time consuming process. Um, first you have to locate it. You then have to make sure that you can get utilities there at a reasonable cost. Because if you build, you know, three quarters of a mile down a dirt path, it's going to cost you money to get power there. Um, and so all of these go into factoring, deciding where you want. And the biggest thing that we ran up to is um, deed restrictions and covenances. These are documents that are attached to the land by an owner at any point in time and they're registered with the county, so they become a legal document attached. And these, these um, deed restrictions and covenances can tell you what you can and can't do with the land that you own, and you cannot get them taken away.
to get them taken away, you have to have the permission of the person who put them there. So you see this a lot in neighborhoods that are set up by a developer. The developer will buy this big piece of property, subdivide it up into parcels, and then um, sell off the property. But they attach deed restrictions to each property that they sell. Things like your house must be 2,300 square feet. It must be one story or two stories. It must be must, 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 must. And a lot of these can drive up the, the cost of a home. It's just, you know, you go into a neighborhood and suddenly just to build against the, again, to, to fulfill the deed restrictions, it could cost an extra $100,000 because you're not gonna build a bigger house. You gotta do, you gotta use brick on the outside. You gotta be two stories. And so these can find, these can be really difficult to find a property that you like and that doesn't have deed restrictions. We managed to find a piece of property that for the past hundred years had been in a single family um, and that was used for agriculture. So it was, it was farmland up until we bought it. That means it had no deed restrictions. And so as long as we don't place any deed restrictions, they will be done forever. Um, I've, I've joked um, with my wife that one of the things I want to do is because I was so tired of deed restrictions. I want to put a deed restriction on my property that say no further deed restrictions may be placed on the property, and that would be legally enforced for the rest of eternity because they would have to have my permission or my descendants' permission to remove that deed restriction. It's it's weird, and unfortunately, deed restrictions do have a negative side. Um, during the fifties, they were used to keep white-only neighborhoods white because um, the deed restrictions say you may you must sell your house to a white person. And so that, that kept um, segregation going on for way longer than it should. So this is what the property looked like. Ah, yeah, the photos don't show up that well in this. Um, it's nothing but a field with grass up to my chest. Um, that's how I found the property. Um, and the, to the property that we have is in Chesney, um, Spartanburg County. Um, it is 3.41 acres. Um, and here is, uh, this is actually our um, grading contractor. Um, after he has gone in and just um, bush hogged the uh, path of the driveway, and you can see that the grass does come up to his, his hip. And um, how I marked out the driveway is I basically took stakes and placed them on the edge of the driveway and then ran string. I said, put my driveway between the string. Um, and, and you can see that basically they went and dug out all of the um, topsoil to get down to the firm clay below. Because when you're putting in a driveway, you don't want organic matter and other crap like that underneath the driveway. And, and what we did is we went with a um, uh, gravel driveway. Um, we went with a gravel driveway mainly because of cost. We have over 300 feet of driveway that's 12, that's 12 feet wide and it would have been crazy expensive to do anything other than gravel. Um, we did have, um, it's called geotextile fabric put down, which is a very thick um, fabric that is difficult to break and it does not deteriorate in the ground. And it separates the dirt from the gravel. And um, my grading contractor, he normally doesn't use this, um, but he used it, I insisted on it for the project and he said, and he said that because of the geotextile fabric, I probably saved three to four thousand dollars in materials because if I didn't have the fabric, when he would drive over it, compress the stones down into the dirt, meaning you need more and more stones. But with the fabric, it keeps that barrier. <laughs> so here you can see me laying out the foundation. So what I did is I took on some 10 inch nails, I drove them into the ground at the corners and then ran string and said, this is the outline of the house. Um, that little bump out is um, what we were planning on using for a little stoop, um, but we, have, we had to go away from that for another reason. Um, so here you can see um, on the left, um, you can see the gravel um, driveway. And this is putting in the conduit. Um, 
I had to run this pipe for the water line, um, or I had to run this trench for the water line. So I was already digging it. So while I had the trench open, I dropped in some conduit, um, which right now is filled with Ethernet and power, um, which feeds a camera that's sitting by the driveway. Um, and here is the concrete slab. Um, you can see the little step there. And when, when I had them, um, when it was still wet, I had them put in bolts, which you can, I don't know if y'all here can see that, but there's, there's little bolts sticking up and they're, they're J bolts. So they're embedded in the concrete and because the concrete compresses really well, they're extremely difficult to pull out. Um, and right behind it, you can see our shipping container. Um, during this process, I needed a place to store my expensive materials and my tools, somewhere that is protected and wet. I got that container delivered for 2,300 bucks. Um, it's 40 feet, um, 40 feet long, eight feet wide, and um, nine feet tall. And great for storing all the material, all the expensive materials and the tools. Um, and here I had to level the container because it was slid off the back of the truck and it made opening the doors difficult because um, it wasn't level, they were binding. Um, and so I found a local railroad company that had these railroad checks. They're rated for 15 tons each. The container is 8,000 pounds um, empty. Um, there's some stuff in it, so it's probably about um, 10,000 pounds at this point. And I was able by myself to lift this container up um, with these two jacks. And so I had to level it out, um, paying for it. Um, this, was a, this was a lot more difficult than I thought, and I made, I made, a, I made a few mistakes here that made the process even more difficult. Um, so a couple different ways you could pay for it. Um, paying for just a, a building, building something in general. Um, there's cash, um, there's loans, mortgages, and other types of financing. Cash is great if you have it, good luck. Um, then you have loans. Um, the loan I had to settle on was an unsecured personal line of credit, um, which has a very high interest rate. For a loan, it is very expensive. It was 12% interest rate. And when you're borrowing, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars. That can be a very expensive payment. The advantage with a personal loan is it acts like a credit card. So the pay, what you have to pay month, proportionate to the amount of debt on it. So when you start out the building process, you're not hit with a thousand dollar a month payment because you have a very little amount of debt on it. The next, the next is mortgages. You cannot get a mortgage on an unfinished house. You can't get a mortgage on a house you don't have yet. You can't get a mortgage on something that isn't certified for occupancy. You can't get a construction mortgage um, for a house that's not built by a contractor. On a, on a mortgage for, a, for building a house through a contractor, the bank would have to approve the contractor, the bank would have to approve the plans, and then they dole out the money according to our progress schedule. And so the, the problem with that is if the bank doesn't approve your house, it's 440 square feet, or if you're building it yourself, you're not an approved contractor. So I, that wasn't an option for me. And other types of financing would be friends and family, begging, stealing, borrowing, or other methods. I don't recommend the stealing. Um, so this is what it looks like in March. Um, this is starting to put up the walls. Um, one thing, because my um, linear square feet was small, I wanted to um, make up a little bit of it with volume. So I, most houses are constructed with um, 96 inch studs, which comes out to about eight, eight and a half feet. Um, mine, I did all with 10 foot studs. So my walls already are already a little two feet taller than the average house. <laughs> um, and so what you're seeing right now is looking um, with, with your back to the container, looking through the kitchen and into the living room and bedroom area. It's not that big. That right there is 20 feet. 
Um, one of the downsides about laying out your property when your weeds and grass are up to your chest is you can't tell the topology of the, of the property. And this is one of my rooms. Um, I built the driveway in the absolute lowest part of the entire property. And so this is after one of our lovely spring storms that dumps two inches of rain in half an hour that I end up with my driveway becoming a lake. And we, for a long time, we nicknamed it Lake Underwood. Um, and it would take about four to five days to drain out. Um, this ended up costing about $8,000 later to fix. Um, <coughs> so here you can see, um, we went the very traditional gable style roof, which means that on two sides of the house, it's flat all the way up. And then on the other two sides, it is flat up until the roof. And then there's a simple pitch, which you can see right here. Um, and this is actually both gables, gable ends stacked on each other um, with one of them having windows. So the front one, um, which is on the bottom of the stack right there has the windows. Um, and I'm standing up on the scaffolding. So here you see a very interesting solar array in battery setup. Um, it comes out, I don't know the exact pitch, it is, it's five and a half feet tall and 11 feet run. So it's close to a one to two. Usually you say five, 12, five inches of drill. Yeah, th th this is, it's, it would be like a 12, six then. It's close to a 12, six. Um, and so it's, on a metal roof, it's a little steep. Um, to, to walk on comfortably. But if I went any shallower, I would lose headroom within the room. So I, I, I kind of met a middle ground with the height that I chose. Um, so last, um, in 2016, um, or, 20, or 2017, um, I went out and did the network for the Southern California Linux Expo, which means I was out in California for um, a a little over a week while I was building. And our container was broken into. It, it turns out containers are thief magnets when they're sitting by themselves on a construction site because they assume tools and materials. So they, they, they cut the locks and got in. And my wife actually was the one who discovered this. And so um, I had her run off and get some better locks. Because uh, the locks, in hindsight, I had were not that actually that good. Um, I was a little naive. Um, and so, but they are better locks. But I had the problem with, I did not want to bring on a bunch of expensive building materials. Because, you know, it was like, it was like going to be like $5,000 of materials that were going to be dropped at the property. I didn't want to just leave those by themselves, given that we've already been broken into once. So... So it was about $1,000 worth of tools and materials. I didn't have that much in the container yet, but I was planning on putting a lot more in it. And so um, they, never caught, they never caught them. Um, frankly, the Spartanburg Sheriff's Office couldn't give a, couldn't give a fuck about it, sorry. Um, yeah, I've not been about that at all. Um, so I wanted a way to, to, as a deterrent, to keep an eye on the property and to offer a deterrent. So I, being, being IT, I was like, okay, cameras. The problem with cameras is they need power. And whatever you record the cameras on needs power, laptop in my case. And so I didn't have permanent power at the property. And even if I had permanent power at the property, it would basically be an extension cord running 200 feet up to my, my temporary construction pole, which any, any robber would just have to simply unplug and could turn off the cameras. And so what I did is um, I got a smoking deal on these um, AGM batteries. It's, I got 36 batteries for less than 700 bucks. They still had factory warranty. And at the time I got them, I could have scrapped them for 800 bucks. So I got them for less than scrap value. Um, yeah, it's a, it, and they still had a manufacturer warranty. So I already had the battery array. But I needed a way to charge them. 
So I threw up some solar panels, which you can see sitting on top of the container. It's a thousand watts, and in the long and in, in the end run, it ran the cameras, the laptop, and a mini fridge. Um, I had a mini fridge in there that I could keep water cold because working in uh, May, June, and July, you need something cold to drink. And it's expensive and time consuming to run down, run down to QT to get your big bacon. So I had a mini fridge that I kept stocked with water. Um, and this battery rate, um, this one right here is 24 feet. Um, and there, it's a 48 volt string um, and each battery is 72 amp hours. Um, so it ran everything um, for about four months without a problem. Permitting. Um, like I said in the beginning, this project was permitted through Spartanburg County Building um, Department. Um, as a homeowner, I could pull a building permit, and I did, but I had to sign um, a document that basically was homeowner built home, you know, something, something, da 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 da. And that was that that is attached to my deed um, because I didn't go through a licensed contractor. That was one additional step. Um, that wasn't the only permit. Um, I also had um, um, I don't have city sewer, so I have a septic system. I had to get a DHEC permit, which was about 200, 250 bucks. Um, and they will send out um, a technician that will do, um, that will look at your land, look at where you're proposing to put stuff and see if your property qualifies for a septic system and where and what type. Um, and so he came out, he did a core sample. So he just used an auger and went down um, six feet and then laid out all the dirt in a line as he pulled it out. So he was able to look at the layers of clay and soil that I had. And then he started flipping through his book, um, rubbing the soil between his fingers to find out what its clay versus sand content was. Um, and, and then he drew a chart um, on the document and like a little layer of, of the soil going down six feet and said, yep, you qualify for a septic system. Um, because basically what they were looking for is would the soil permit the, the water to drain down and not percolate up to the surface. Yes, yes, um, I have city water. Um, but one of the things that they look at is what is the proximity to surface water, like a river, a stream, a pond? What is the proximity to someone else's um, well water? And so you, DHEC will figure out if you are far enough away from all of that. And if you are, they give you a thumbs up and a permit. I found out contractors really, septic contractors will not talk to you unless you have a septic permit. So they go, go away and get your permit. And so you, then you give them the permit and they're happy to talk to you. Um, the sentence is costing about 2,500. Yes. Uh, the leach field or the tank? So what, what the DHEC did is, um, in, in my case, is they also marked out where would be a future leach field, which is the part where it drains the water. They marked out, if my leach field now becomes damaged, here is where you would put your new leach field. Um, as far as the tank, I don't know. I, um, I think you can actually get it dug up and replaced, um, but they have to do a lot of digging because anything that gets contaminated, they have to remove from your site. Very, very yes. Um, and then the last permit I had was I had to get a driveway access permit. Um, and my, my particular road is a county road. And if you look at the symbols, at least in Spartanburg County, 
If you look at the street signs, the, the green ones, they'll have a bird on the end of them. That, those are county maintained roads. If it's got the state seal, those are state maintained roads. And so who owns the roads controls who can, um, well, basically, well, you have to get your permit from, and mine was a county permit. And basically what they wanted to do is make sure that where I put my driveway was, it was first off wide enough, it had to be 20 feet, and B, it was safe. So it wasn't too close to someone else's, it wasn't in a dangerous spot. Um, and so um, I, I had to get that approved. And, and I think, I, I, if I remember right, there was no cost on the driveway permit. And um, basically the, to get it, once, you permit, once the permit is done, you then go for the final inspection and the dude just drove by and, and gave, gave a thumbs up as driving by that I passed. I, I, so my case, I went a little wider. I actually have a 25 foot driveway. Um, it's um, be, because the concrete pipes came in a certain size. I told my contractor to just do it the size of the pipes. Um, and at least Spartanburg County allows you to do gravel all the way up to road's edge. So I did not have to do any concrete or asphalt work. I was able to do gravel all the way up to road's edge, which saved, saved me money. But Spartanburg did require me to put in a drainage pipe um, that was a concrete reinforced pipe that, that was their specification and you have to follow it. <laughs> so this is what the house looked like in April. Um, I have the roof, I have the roof system done and the, um, the sheathing started. It's not already done. Um, it was me, my dad, my father-in-law, and a family friend. We framed the roof in four hours on a Sunday afternoon. Um, the most amount of work that was done on the house at any given time. And... I was still working full time during this house. I went to four tens at work. So I worked Monday through um, Thursday. Um, after I got done at 6.30, I would then um, shove food in my mouth as I'm driving to the build site. And while I would build until, um, until the night was chasing me out, like which is close to here. And then I would work all day, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday on the house. Um, and I did this for um, four months. Um, so this is also April. Um, now you can start to see that the, the all the plywood is up and um, the scaffolding. I ended up buying scaffolding because it was cheaper than renting it. That, that scaffolding right there was about 500 bucks. And to rent scaffold was about 500 a month. And I ended up using that consistently for four or five months. So I bought it. Um, now I have a giant amount of scaffolding that I don't actually need at this moment, but I have it. Um, well, yeah. yeah. And so uh, what you see on the left is start of the soffit. Um, so these are called false rafters. So they're not a full size rafter, they're smaller. Um, and they extend over, and this one, this, one of the things that this does is it protects the siding on, on the side of your house because the water is not directly hitting it. It's, it's going onto the roof. Um, this is also an April. You can start to see that the framing is going really fast. There's a lot of progress being made during the framing stage. It went, it went surprisingly fast. Um, so here I have a um, roof, me roof membrane on. Um, and I wasn't sure when I'd be able to put the roof on. And so normal tar paper um, only has, can only stay exposed to the weather, I think a week before it starts deteriorating. Where this, um, this is a synthetic product um, that's uh, um, approved for longer uses. And this actually is rated by the manufacturer to be exposed for six months. Hey Jason, can you get me a water? Um, and um, here you can see the bathroom window is, um, is the, the long rectangle one, which I'm going to do, um, I ended up doing glass block on. <laughs> so, dealing with contractors, it's got to be one of the most 
frustrating things and that still puzzles me today because I'm still having to deal with them occasionally is it seems like contractors, at least in this area, they're super busy and so they don't care about your business. They don't return your calls. They don't answer your calls. When, when you call them and they say they're going to call you back, you know, tomorrow, they never do. You have to hound them and hound them and hound them and hound them and hound them just to give them damn money. It is amazing that contractors are so incredibly busy right now that they don't care. So that, that face right there sums up my feelings on dealing with contractors. Um, so I dealt with, um, I did at a, plumbing contractor that did the plumbing underneath the concrete slab. Um, uh, that did not turn out well. He didn't do any more work for me. I had the grading contractor, and then I had um, the drywall people, which did not turn out well either. Um, so again, I hate those contractors. Um, I did all of the framing, electrical, uh, plumbing above ground, um, painting, roof, siding, um, all that I, I did either myself or with the help of my dad and family friends. I ended up cutting it away and running it through the walls uh, because I couldn't undo it because it, it was in the concrete slab. Um, so here it is in May. You can start to see the interior is now starting to be framed up. Um, and originally I wasn't planning on doing a loft. Um, I was going to have the bedroom ceiling go all the way up. And then actually standing in the space going, holy crap, that is, that is a lot of space up there. Uh, why not put a roof, you know, why not put um, a, some, a floor on it? And so I did a little quick numbers and it would cost about uh, four to five hundred extra materials to put a loft. I was like, okay, fine, loft done. Um, and at least I'm able to stand up in the loft, so with about an inch above my head, and I'm right at about six foot. And so it, but as you start going down the sides, you do have to hunch over. Um, so here it's in May. Um, this was a great day because I finally, first off, I got the house secured by putting a door on it. So now I could start to leave materials and or tools within side, not always having to clean up because it, it, it was very annoying after you just spent all day working to then have to spend half an hour picking up your crap and putting it away in a secured location. No, I did not disassemble scaffolding. I felt with the scaffolding that it was so it was so much work to disassemble to get it out of the house that it wasn't worth stealing. Um, because it, it would take me about half an hour to just disassemble or reassemble it myself. I'm like, no, I'm not doing this every time. And the other thing is that once I got the Tyvex on, the house um, and the windows and the other stuff starting to be done, it became watertight. And so now at least I don't have the feeling like, oh my God, I have all this lumber everywhere. It's gonna get wet, it's gonna get ruined. I, at least I now was like, okay, I am now dry, dried in as they, as they call it. Um, this is where I took the opportunity to run some of my ethernet cables. Um, and my logic is I tried to put an ethernet cable every possible place I could think I would need an ethernet cable. Um, and so in my loft that is less than 20 feet wide, I have three ethernet cables. Why? Because I can't. Um, and the other thing I also did is I ran Ethernet cables to the exterior of my house for cameras. I was like, I'm, I know I'm going to put cameras. I'm going to go and run the Ethernet. So now all my I have um, four cameras on the exterior, one on every um, corner, um, and they all are hardwired in. So I don't have to worry about batteries. I don't have to worry about them being on Wi-Fi. They're Ethernet in, and I run PoE. Um, I ended up filling up a 24 port patch panel with just ethernet from a 440 square foot house. Yeah, yeah, I'm that person. Uh, so here, here is where I start um, running the electrical and the plumbing. Um, I hate doing the, the, the vent and drain of plumbing, which is all the white stuff. 
because it's stiff, it doesn't bend well, and you have to maintain slope. Water does not run downhill, and there's a certain prescribed slope, which is an eighth inch for every foot, if I remember right, is the minimum slope to actually get water to run. And so every time I ran a horizontal run, I had to calculate slope. That's why I did very few runs of horizontal. Um, and then the pump I used is PEX, uh, which is a plastic uh, pipe that is flexible, happens to be color coded, um, red and blue. And it allows you to reduce the number of um, joints with, uh, or connections within your walls. Um, and it's a lot easier to run because you're not having to put in a two foot piece of pipe and uh, then solder it with a four foot piece of pipe because you can't bend copper, um, at least normal copper water lines you can't bend. And also soldering is an art, an art that I am not good at. Um, and so I chose to, um, I used um, crit connections. So it took a, um, I believe it was a brass or copper ring that I put on the outside of the text, put it on a fitting, and then I used a crimper tool, just crimped it down, and it squeezed that copper ring so tight that it made it watertight. Um, and then here I'm starting to run all the electrical lines. Um, it, was, it was a lot of work, um, but I got it. I actually enjoyed the electrical part. Um, I enjoyed some of the plumbing. I enjoyed the framing. Um, I didn't enjoy the other stuff. I'll get to that. So utilities. I'm on city water, uh, Duke Power, Charter Internet, and Subject System. Um, a lot of people, when talking about tiny homes, they always talk about going off the grid, off the grid, off the grid. Well, what that actually means um, for a lot of people is a composting toilet, which means you're pooping in sawdust, and then you've got to carry your, your waste outside. Um, it means using a lot of propane, because instead of, instead of an electric stove, an electric dryer, you have to use propane. Propane heat, propane stove, propane dryer. Propane's expensive. Um, propane because I have a tankless hot water heater. Um, and it's expensive. Um, other is um, grid power. A lot of people talk about power, getting grid power, utility power is, is expensive. For me, it was free. I paid nothing up front for my power. I only have a monthly bill and that's fine because my power usage is only about 60 bucks a month, um, even with all the crap I'm running. And because I was within less than 300 feet of from where I wanted the power meter to be and where Duke had a, had a telephone or power pole, they ran it underground for free. So they, they came and dug um, it was about 200 feet worth and, and put it in there and didn't charge me a dime. Um, and then um, they also had to put a telephone pole on my property because I had power lines running over a corner of my property and uh, due to right of way, in order for them to get on my property, they would either have to ask permission and pay my neighbor to get right of way to my property um, or put um, across the street. And so that means they're now um, bringing it under the road, which is a lot more permitting for them, or they could sink a telephone pole or a power pole on my property, hang the transformer and run the power like that. They, they chose to do that. Um, and the other thing is when I chose the property, I chose it, one of the reasons I chose it is because it had charter already running along that same right of way with Duke. And so I looked up there and I saw their connection box and I was like, that's charter. And so um, I didn't have to pay anything to charter to get them in my, to get in my house either. Yeah. You see, you see Yes, they, 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 they put it on my property <coughs> under their existing power lines. Um, so this is um, in June. Uh, you can see we got the roof on. Uh, this, 
The red roof is one of my favorite features of the house. It's, it's a red metal roof. It's very classic. Um, one thing I did find out about metal roofs is um, when you get a hailstorm, the insurance company will not pay to replace it because after a hailstorm, a metal roof is, is not structurally damaged. It may be visually dented, but it's not actually damaged. Um, and looking at the specifications of my roof, I believe it's got a class four hail rating, which means it's rated for to withstand up to two inch hailstones, which are unheard of in this area. So I'll never have any issues with my roof. And by having a metal roof, you do get slightly cheaper insurance rates because they know that uh, you know, every five years they're not having to replace your shingles because of a hailstorm. Um, here you can also see our siding. It is hardy board con fiber concrete. So it, it's actually a concrete with a fiber in it and it's, it's put out on boards. Um, and, but one of the advantages is it has a fire rating equivalent to brick. So that is also reduces your insurance because uh, your house is less likely to catch on fire if something outside is on fire. And so um, all of, you know, between the party board, these are premiums. They're not cheap. The cheap and shingles. Um, you know, I, I paid probably an extra three or four thousand to have this, but I think it's worth it. Wow. And yeah, and and something else I made a conscious decision, and you'll see pictures of it later, is I don't have any vegetation up against the house. I have a four foot band that goes all the way around my house of gravel. So I, I have nothing that's flammable near my house. Um, one thing I underestimated is just how long it takes to put up a party board. It is by far the longest, or it is the thing that I spent the most time on. I spent five or six weekends doing nothing but hardy board. It's slow. The pieces are fragile. They're, they're, they're pretty strong in a vertical, but if while you're carrying these 16 foot boards, or 12 foot, I think it's 12 or 16, um, if you slip and the thing rolls on its side, it'll snap in half. Um, and the boards are $10 a piece. And so they, they, they was, it was quite a bit of an expense. And in hindsight, I may not have gone with Hardy Board. I, I may have gone with something else. Um, but I do like the look of the lapped siding. Um, uh, it's a very classic look. And, and here you can also see the, um, the bathroom window and all the trim that you see on the exterior of the house is, it is either metal, concrete, or PVC. I have no exterior wood. I do not want to paint wood. Um, and so the, the trim around the windows is all PVC. So the same stuff they make pipes out of, they also make trim out of. Um, I did uh, most of the electrical um, and running some of the cables, particularly the gray one and the cable for the stove. The stove cable is, um, I believe it was six gauge wire and it's the size of your thumb and it's extremely difficult to bend. And getting it through my house was rather interesting. Um, I, I, do not, I do not miss running that cable. The, the, the white ones and the yellow ones, which are 15 and 20 amps um, outlets, those are not bad to run. Um, the gray one is a 30 amp, which goes to my dryer and my dishwasher, or my dryer and my AC. Those are a little more difficult, but the stove was by far the worst. Uh, <coughs> um, one thing I didn't estimate is how expensive breakers are. Your standard breakers um, are only about five dollars, but um, the newer electrical codes require arc fault breakers um, in things like bedrooms and living rooms. Basically, what an arc fault breaker does is if it sees an arc um, from hot to either neutral or ground, it will look at the sine wave and, and be able to tell if it's arcing and it will cut power. 
So if your wire is nicked by a screw or something like that, it will, it will permit a short or a spark that could burn your house down. It's great. Um, then there's also, there's certain places where you require GFCI, which are um, it, um, around wet locations like kitchen and bathroom. Well, they, the breakers, they don't sell either just um, arc fault or just GFCI. They, they do, but they're like 40 bucks. But for 50 bucks, you can get a combo that is both arc fault and ground fault. And so there are places where you have to use these more expensive breakers. And so I ended up spending like 600 or like 300 bucks in Justin breakers that I was not planning for. And that, that came out a bit of, bit of a hard hit. Um, another mistake I made is my breaker panel is a little small. I really wish I went with a, with a normal side-by-side, -side, um, which would give a lot more wiggle room for your, for your arms. And, and when you're, when you're manipulating the um, little um, 12 and 14 gauge wire, that space is not bad. But when I had to run, I ran 100 amps to my container, which used, I used um, two gauge uh, aluminum. And it was, so it was um, two, two, four, and six were the, were the wire gauges. Um, in this one bundle and it it was about a three quarters of an inch thick and manipulating that in the panel was extremely difficult and and so that was one of the uh mistakes i made is not using a bigger power panel and i really should have um something else i did spark for is um right here you can see that i have a whole house surge protector it's only like 120 bucks so I, I felt like it, it was worth that go ahead and placing that insulation. Um, I did not enjoy this process. It was time consuming. It was monotonous. Um, fortunately, the particular brand I have is not your traditional fiberglass. It was John, John's main. Um, yes. Um, and their insulation is not itchy. It's like it's not like the pink stuff, which if you wear the pink, if you use the pink stuff, your arms will be on fire after. This wasn't. So it, I, I don't know what they do different, but it was a lot more tolerable. And in the walls, I did an R15, um, and the ceiling I did an R30, which um, R30 for the ceiling is this code, and R13 for the walls as code. So I did a little above code on that. Um, and then in June, uh, I finally got all the insulation built and the bathtub installed. Um, I went with, um, this is an extra deep bathtub. Um, it's, it, it's the same footprint as far as width um, and length, but it's a little extra deep. Um, and I, I think it's a Delta 400. I don't know why I remember that so well. Um, but it, <laughs> But it was, it was a four piece um, tub. So it wasn't, it did not come as a giant symbol. Um, it basically, it was the tub and then the three wall pieces. Um, here is yet more siding. Oh my God, more siding. Um, here I got the air conditioning installed. Problem is at this stage, I don't have power yet. So even though I had the air conditioning installed, I'm just sweating, uh, sweating in the house. Um, and what you see on the back um, here on, the, on this little photo is um, a utility closet. And I have my hot water heater, I have my network switch, and I also have some batteries. I'll, I'll show that in a second. And you can see the vent pipe um, up here. And, and because the amount of um, propane piping I had to do was so small, I was able to run it and, and the propane company had no problems with that. Um, I did have them, after they turned gas on, they did, I did have them check all the connections to make sure nothing was leaking. Um, drywall. This was, this was a rough point. Um, the, we were running up, we had two weeks. So this is two weeks before we moved in. Um, and, 
it was right around the 4th of July. Well, all the drywallers, all of them took a week off. So getting people in to do it was, was difficult. And then the job that they did, I did not like it because you could still see, in, in a few different places, you can see the seams because they didn't do a very good job. But it's done. Um, eventually, maybe one day in the future, I might get it fixed. Um, painting. At first, I wasn't, I was well hesitant about the colors, but um, I, I, I was tired and I disagreed with Allison on the colors. And they turned out pretty well. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and here you can see that um, I got the bathroom installed and it was also, it was another great day when I got the toilet installed because I didn't have to run to QT every time I needed to go to the bathroom, um, which became a large time sink or use nature's toilets. Uh, when you got three and a half acres, you can find privacy. Um, this was another great thing. Duke finally came in and installed. Um, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so here you can see they're starting the prep work to set, a, to set the pole. And they brought a squad. I mean, they, there's three trucks there, then there's another truck off in the background, and then a pickup truck with the supervisor. It was like, it was like 25 dudes that just swarm the property. And the other thing is they don't even notice. They just show up. Um, and then um, they, they, they subdivide the crews into the underground crew and the aerial crew. And so this is the aerial crew. They, they set the telephone pole, they do all the above ground stuff. They didn't, I asked, you know, okay, well, when's the guy gonna be here to run the cable from the house? He goes, oh, two to three weeks. I, I'm moving in a week, I need power. And so I rattled enough cages, you know, um, pinched enough of a fit that it went uh, high enough up to the chain and they managed to get the regional supervisor involved and got the underground crew out the same day. Um, and the, 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 the guy who called, the, 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 the supervisor of the underground crew, he's like, this is unheard of. I'm never, you know, my, my three levels, three levels high supervisor called me and told me to come, come to this address and do this job. Um, and so the underground crew ran the wire, hooked it up to the power meter, and then stood it up the pole. But they're the underground crew. So then these folks had to come back out here to actually hook it up to the transformer, at which point I was able to finally get power. And guess what? I turned that AC on high, and I got it down to like 60, 62 degrees in there, and it felt good. After sweating at 95 degrees for so many days. So this is in July, right before we moved in. This is what the house looked like. It was livable. It was a little rough though. Um, and so this is after we have already moved in, um, in August. So when I, we originally planned on just doing stoop. Um, and then um, I was working um, in the house during the framing stage and a big thunderstorm came through. And it started, the, the, this front wall started to move in and out like two to three inches. I was like, oh crap, I can't have this. Um, I was like, okay, what can I do to stiffen this wall up without having to reframe it? I was like, I'll put a porch on it. And so what you see here is me setting the header for the porch. And the header by itself already stiffens up the wall because it's, it's a piece of wood that goes the entire length and it's both, it's lagged in to the wall, so it's not moving. Uh, and here I, um, I, I finished the boxing for the soffit. So um, there's a soffit and fascia. The soffit is the uh, flat part that's underneath and the fascia is the flat part that is vertical. Um, and then I have a very lovely um, Russian neighbor named um, Vladimir, and he worked as a former commercial roofer. Um, and then in um, 08, when the economy took a crack, he started um, buying distressed, foreclosed houses, doing a little bit of work and turning around and selling them. And so I didn't ask, he just offered to come over and help do. And so he helped with the fascia, the soffit, and 
um, Hutley installed his metal roof. Um, and and I, I, you know, he's a great guy, and he didn't even charge for it, which was uh, amazing because at, at, during this point, money was very tight. Um, and um, here's we originally were going to go with the engineered um, laminate um, floor that clicks together and floats. Don't do that if you're going to be in a wet location. Um, we had some our front door, and we'd come in from outside, and we had a little wet, you know, some water on the bottom of our shoe, and we take our shoes off and put it there. Well, very first time after doing that, the wood swelled. Um, when it got wet, the flooring swelled when it got wet. I was like, oh, I can't have this crap. And so before they could put kitchen cabinets in, I needed to do something with the flooring. I was like, what can I do? You know, I had this concrete slab and that is true. I didn't have my COA yet. Um, and so I ripped, I ripped up all the flooring from the kitchen and, and put down, this is garage epoxy paint. Um, so it, it's very um, glossy here, but it does, it does matten out over time, which is fine for us. And so I did that in the bathroom and the kitchen, which is what you see here. It's really difficult to live in a house when you suddenly have to go from 440 square feet of usable space down to 200 square feet and all the stuff living with it. So everything that was in the kitchen and bathroom had to be moved to the other half of the house. Um, that was fun and difficult. Yes, the contractor did put a vapor barrier under it. Um, but one of the advantages with this garage paint is it, is, is it also is a vapor barrier. After it dries, it is in primary of a moisture, um, which, we, we had a huge issue with moisture, um, particularly over the winter when we were, we were not running the AC. Um, we were getting indoor humidity of uh, pushing 80% uh, relative humidity, which is crazy indoors. But when you have dryer, you got sink, you got dishwasher, you have um, shower, you got bath, you got humans breathing, you got animals breathing. There's a lot of things producing moisture. And in such a small space, it's easy for the indoor moisture to shoot up. Getting a dehumidifier was the best thing we've ever did. So now we got a dehumidifier that keeps it right at 40% relative humidity. So this is the kitchen in January of this year. Um, so for seven months, we lived with no kitchen and no insurance. And we got a kitchen this top. Um, and I think it looks damn good. Um, and the, um, that is a full size stacking washer and dryer. So um, these, are, these units were actually just, um, marketed to be sold side by side. They're, they're standard front load washer and dryer. What I found out is these are actually LGs, but most brands are this way. That LG sells a, a $35 stacking kit, which are a set of rails that Home Depot had in stock. I picked them up, slapped them on, and I was able to stack them. Um, and so that's, um, I was able to do all of that. Um, and so we have normal size stuff. That's, that's one thing I want to harp on is this is our normal house. We have a normal dishwasher. We have a normal, um, washer and dryer. We have a queen bed. We, so we have normal things. This is not a kooky, uh, tiny home on wheels where, you know, you pull a string to get your bed down or anything like that. It's a full size stove, full size refrigerator. Um, one of my favorite features is I love the um, tile backsplash. I like the simplest of the white subway tile. And being, high, being a high gloss tile, they're very easy to clean. Um, so this is also um, January of this year is um, I start doing the um, exterior work. Because I get with two dogs and humans and a lot of red clay exposed. It, it was a constant battle to keep dirt out. And so by starting, just even doing this helped because it, it gave a place where we could walk that was not dirt. Um, and this also goes again, this also helps with, um, with weeds 
And also, if, if there was a fire in the grass, it, it would come up against the metal edging and stop four feet away from the house. So saving the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely helps, and also helps that um, we don't have to worry about tree roots or roots getting underneath the slab, or or even vines damaging the exterior of the house. Um, so one of the things that I didn't fully plan out is there was a bit of a slope on the side of our house. And I was concerned that during a heavy, heavy storm, that water would rush down the hill and straight into the house. Um, and so what I did is um, I rented a backhoe and dug that back and put in a, a block wall. Um, that, that right there is about 2,000 pounds worth of um, block that was extremely heavy to move. Um, we also put in French drains and um, yard drains to try to collect the water. Um, and this is, we had to do all of this to prevent our lake from forming. Um, and so what we do is we try to collect the water in the various places and at the driveway and funnel it to a retention pond. And getting all that done costs us about $8,000. Um, so here, this is March and May of this year. Um, starting to build the deck um, and me over engineering a little bit. Um, I, I went with an eight by eight post. Everyone says it's overkill. In re reality, it is overkill, but it looks beefy. Um, and it is. Um, and then um, here is the deck actually finished. Um, the decking material we went with is a composite decking material. That is, um, it is uh, plastic and sawdust that's melted together and it does not rot. It does not, you don't paint it. If it gets scratched, the color's all the way through. No maintenance. And it's, it uses a hidden fastener system. So when you look at it, you don't see any screws. Um, and then for lighting, I put in this, um, I wanted some accent lighting, so I just did some rough light um, and a ceiling fan. Um, I did end up finishing this, um, which I might have a photo later. And then um, it is difficult to paint pressure treated wood. It does not absorb paint very well. And so what I ended up doing was wrapping it in PVC. So again, I have no exposed wood. Um, then this is the next project was actually finishing the loft. And you can see this is June of this year that this finally got done. So from, for, all, for a year, it was just plywood. Now we had crap up there because it was, it was conditioned space that was storage, um, but this is actually finishing the project. Um, and so put the flooring down. I did go with the same laminate flooring up here, but it's fine because there's no, there shouldn't be any water up there. Um, and then for the railing, um, I took a two inch metal, um, black pipe, like a uh, black iron pipe, and just spray painted it black and drilled holes in it and ran cables. Now, one thing is, um, Spartanburg County does not know about this because if they, if they considered it living space, then I would need to have an appropriate set of stairs, which I don't have space for. So one of the reasons we left it unfinished for our inspection is because it's storage. Um, but I just end up putting this ladder so we can actually use it. Um, and the ladder, so originally we were planning on getting one fabricated, but again, dealing with contractors and actually getting them to do anything is difficult. So I ended up finding this ladder for a hundred bucks on Amazon. It was a great deal. It is telescoping and I, I, don't, I don't know if I have a photo of it, but basically it telescopes and folds onto the floor, so it's completely out of the way. So this is what it looks like as of right now. Um, this photo was taken a few days ago. Um, and you can see that, you know, we start to get flowers, and we're starting to do the nice decorative things now that we're no longer building the house itself. Um, I know this is an atrocious wiring mess. I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, but you know what, it works. And it's mine, and I'm the only one going in there. So you know what? 
F all y'all for, for, for thinking anything negative. It works. Um, I got my network switch, I got my cable modem, I got my access point, I got actually two switches here. Um, but what you see on the left is actually my um, UPS for my house. Again, I had all these batteries. So I, I hooked them up and it will run my refrigerator, all the lighting in the house, all my network, the electric control for the hot water heater, a ceiling fan and a few other things for about nine to 10 hours. Um, and so far we haven't had to use it. Power has been surprisingly pretty stable. Um, and this is what the inside looks like. Um, so this is the living room and uh, bedroom. And that's a queen bed that we got from Ikea. So it's got storage underneath. So we got big drawers that pull out that gives us storage underneath. And there's also a closet. Um, you can kind of see it right here on the left of this one picture. Um, it's a seven foot wide, two feet deep. So it's, it's a decent sized closet. Um, and then we also got shelves for the cat. He occasionally goes up there. And um, the TV's wall mounted and then also more IKEA furniture underneath as a display. Total cost, 20. I paid $27,000 for the land. And the house itself costs about 50000 for the materials for labor that I paid for. Um, at this rate, I should have this entirely paid off in about a year and a half. At which point, I'll have no rent, no mortgage, no debt. Um, <laughs> except I'm going to go right back into debt when I build a main house, <laughs> um, which is part of the future plans. Um, we have three and a half acres. I know that. 440 square feet is not sustainable to have a family. It's not. Um, and so we are planning on building a main house on the same property, at which point the current studio, as it sits, should rent for about 14 to 1600 a month to short-term traveling nurses. They, because they get, they get a per diem for their housing and their short-term 13 weeks, they travel with typically with no kids by themselves. Um, so they're not going to be parting out, you know, yahoos or bringing in a little munchkins. Um, and they have a high disposable income. And I'm um, less than 10 minutes from Farmer Regional and Mary Black hospitals. So, and my competition would be hotels. Would you rather live in a hotel for the same cost or live in my studio with high speed internet? on sweet laundry, you know, private, you know, you don't have hoodlands, you know, above you. Um, and the, the rent payments should more than cover the mortgage payments of the house, probably by about two X. So at which point I'll have the house paid for in, a, in probably 10 to 15 years, the house will be paid for completely and the studio will be residual income perpetually. For more information, um, there's a tiny URL with a link to close to 400 pictures, um, even more detailed than what I've gone into, and you can always shoot me an email if you got questions. Thank you. I know, I'm a little crazy. I no, I am not doing that meeting. And um, actually, um, two to three weeks ago, um, Duke hit a certain threshold um, with net metering agreements. Um, and so they are no longer providing retail rates on net metering. So if you sign up now for net metering, Duke will pay you wholesale rates, which is five to six kilowatt. Um, Five to, five to six cents per kilowatt hour, where retail rate is 11 to 13. Um, so right now the batteries simply act as a UPS. Grid power goes out, batteries kick over, and it, the switchover is fast enough that my servers and computers do not go offline. Um, long term, I'm, um, Outback makes a inverter charger combo that will take grid power and solar power and mix them to 
to minimize the amount of grid power that you have to buy without selling back. Yes, without bi-directional. Because the other thing with bi-directional is permitting. You've got to have get county permits. You've got to get licensed electricians out. You've got to get Duke's permission. With the way I'm setting up, because I am not backfeeding power, I don't need anyone's permission. And the other thing is demand itself has dropped, per capita has dropped because houses are becoming more efficient. Lighting, lighting between LEDs and compact fluorescents are becoming more efficient. So the actual power usage is going down. Yeah, but it's, it's starting to plateau because of electric cars. Electric cars are gonna start driving demand back up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, this is the bell curve. That's a lot of solar. Yeah, that's the max Well, I, I know what I know what they do with Furman because um, Furman's got a big solar plant um, right on the side of 276, and what they actually do is Furman paid for it, but Duke runs it. So, so it's unlimited capacity. So, because it's a Duke owned or Duke managed facility, they do whatever size they want. So, so that's how they got around that that limit. Yeah. Y'all have any questions? No, I was just trying to do it quick. Yeah. I'll definitely keep an eye on that. Yeah. I, I mean, so far I haven't. Yeah, the, the only problem is, is I, I don't physically have the space to go side by side. So if you go down it, it's a back unit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, this is um, for, for my heating and cooling, I'm running a base split unit. So it's the, the indoor, the indoor part of the unit is probably about three feet wide. Um, and it was 1800 for the unit, uh, for the indoor and outdoor. And I, I did most of the install myself. Um, and it keeps the entire house very cool and very warm. Um, this past winter, we only had to run it for like two or three hours max a day. Um, cause there's a lot of stuff in the house that's producing heat. Yeah, I, I, I got three, I got two, I got a desktop and two servers running. No, um, in general, my philosophy with cameras is all of them are exterior. Um, and the other thing is, um, I have all the openings to the house covered. So door or window, there's a camera. On it. I also have camera on the computer on its door. So that so my, my philosophy is, if you're going to come into my structure, I'm going to know about it. Um, and then also, because I have some extra cameras left over from um, when I did self, I put some on the so that I can just 
die because you know I, I work I'm, you know, I work full time and I can keep an eye on the property. Um, and I do I do plan on doing some home automation stuff. Um, yeah, there's one of the things I'm looking at is um, I want to get a Schleg lock. Um, my current home automation system is built on um, HomeAssist.io. It um, runs on a Raspberry Pi, it's open source. Um, and it does really good at detecting when I'm home. Because what it does is it logs in through the API to my Unify wireless system. And so my phone connects to the wireless, um, Home Assist knows about it almost instantly. And so one of the things that I plan on doing when I get a Schlag lock, it's, it's, it's a network connected lock. And so when the um, home, when, when my home automation sees my home, they will go ahead and unlock the door for me. Um, and, you know, some people go, oh, what about security? What about if you get hacked? You know, at some point, it still becomes easier to just put a brick through your window. Um, and, you know, I'm not worried about someone either hacking my cameras or hacking my home automation. Because at some point, it's easier to physically come to the property and do it. But um, my, my home automation is very simple at this point. I'm hoping that by next summer, I'll have it a lot more developed and I'll possibly even give a talk about it itself. But right now it's still pretty near. Any other questions? No, nothing. <laughs> um, so, uh, I found a guy on Craigslist um, who was selling them, and what it was is he works as a um, UPS technician for commercial facilities. And YFF had just installed new batteries into their UPS um, less than a year before I bought the same batteries. But at that time, they had upgraded equipment and so they now have larger power demands than their UPS could meet. And so they got a brand new UPS with its own batteries. So they, they had these batteries installed less than a year in a condition space hooked up to a battery container. And the, when I bought the batteries, they had three years of manufacturer warranty on them. And so I got them cheaper from for scrap. And the reason is the guy didn't want to see them go to scrap because they were so new. So I got 36 batteries. Um, the retail value on the batteries was over five thousand dollars, and I got for like six hundred. But that also mean I had to move um, close to three thousand pounds of batteries from Greenville to Spartanburg, and then keep rearranging them in the in in the property as as they get in my way. And I actually did have um, I discovered one of the batteries. Um, this past weekend, I went in and I, I saw that there was some corrosion on one of my battery connectors. And one of the, because the batteries are sealed acid, um, and the acid is in a gel. So there should never be any liquid, but there was acid oozing out the top of the battery. I was like, crap, the battery's gone. So I poured a bunch of baking soda over it to neutralize the acid and get the battery moved out. And so now that, that battery's toast. Great, thank you, Zach. We really appreciate you coming today. Thank you. Really